Hello and welcome to the Career Success Podcast. I'm Jason Connolly. If you're a regular listener, it's great to have you back. But if you're new, a big welcome to the show. In this series every week, we speak to the biggest names in business all across the globe. We talk about their career stories, the lessons learned, how they overcome challenges and what success habits they practice. If you have a passion for business, then this is the podcast for you. In this episode, I'm delighted to be joined by Ian Moyes from Wokingham in the UK. Ian Moyes, Chief Revenue Officer at One Up Sales, has sat on the board of a number of related industry bodies. FAST, Federation Against Software Theft, KIF, Cloud Industry Forum and EuroCloud and has been the non-exec to many firms. Ian was awarded the accolade of UK Sales Director of the Year by BESMA, the British Excellence in Sales Management Awards in 2019 and 2020. He was also listed in the top 50 sales keynote speakers by Top Sales World. Ian has been a regular judge on the Women in Sales Awards, WESA, Top Sales Awards, BESMA and the UK Cloud Awards. Ian, thanks for joining me. You're welcome. It makes me feel like how the heck do I find time for all of those things? So. <laughs> well, it's so wonderful to have you on uh, the show and on this episode. So Ian, tell us a bit about you and your career and how it all got uh, started for you. Sure. Yeah. So I, I, I've i worked in the technology sector now for three decades. It's gone quick and started off interesting startup. I got into technology because and when I was 14, a neighbor moved in with a ZX81. Anyone remembering that will, that will date me. <laughs> and I was hooked from that point onwards, programming, etc. And I ended up being a programmer analyst at IBM. And then, and, and this might be part of the conversation we have, and then totally pivoted into a sales role in another company because at that time, hopefully it's changed now, IBM's view was um, that's two different spheres, right? You're not a salesperson if you're, if you're a techie, so to speak. Mm-hmm. So I went to a smaller company against everyone's advice, including my family at the time, of you've got this great job at IBM, you're going to go to a smaller company no one's heard of, to a job you've never done, in sales, do you really want to be in sales? And, and oh, crikey, what's that involve? But I, but I was drawn by the attraction of, in those days, salespeople who had company cars, they had mobile phones, which in those days were a luxury, not not what we see today and they were incredibly expensive in the size of a suitcase but it seemed to me salespeople, my my blinkered opinion then who didn't understand and know what I knew I I understood this stuff I mm. trained and educated on it how hard can sales be when you know what you're talking about and and that was my blase and yet they're getting all the shiny stuff so that's why I made the jump so I pivoted totally and took a risk in believing in myself and just through sheer effort worked my way up from inside sales to field sales in the first year and then never looked back through sales management leadership etc over the years but through really tenacity and just working hard of if i want to do this why can't i do this against everyone's advice whatever i I have a passion for this and i believe in myself and my knowledge how hard can the the talking to people be part of sales and and for now, I've now had the pleasure in the last 15 years of work, 15, 16 years working in the cloud computing technology area, which affects all of our lives for everyone listening, both at work and at play. Because if you think about the world we all live in, we all now use smartphones. We all use applications all over the place like Shazam, all these wondrous things. Mm. They all come about because of cloud computing, AI, big data, all these things you hear about are driven based on the fact that computers in the cloud someone else's computer with intense power is now more affordable and enables people to innovate create and enables us to consume and buy things you know amazon amazon would not exist if it wasn't for the uh deployment and possibilities that cloud computing provide interesting and what was your uh, early days in sales like ian so yeah, funny enough, I've just been, um, un- unfortunately, my mother passed away 18 months ago and I'm just do- helping my father, he's in a home and clearing the clearing the home, etc. So going through the loft of all my old stuff <laughs> and I just came across about a week or so ago, all the old price lists from that very first job and all the memories it brought back. So I can tell you straight away, of, I remember mm. joining and uh, getting a, a one of those price books, a, a pen, all your stationery, great, there's your desk, there's your phone and um, off you go. What? Well, that was it. That was the training. It was start talking to people, figure it out as you go. And I remember making lots of mistakes. I remember, you know, in those days it was physical product. I remember taking product back from clients where they'd ordered the wrong thing or anything and not knowing how to, what was called RMA, how to return it into the business properly, returns, authorizations and all those process things. 
I remember having boxes under the desk piled up to the point where I better figure out what this process is because I can't get my feet under the desk any longer. <laughs> you know, it, it, it was learn on the job. It was, mm -hmm. there was no lots of months. You didn't have time. We were a small business. So I learned from the people around me. I just had to figure it out, get your hands dirty. And, and that has stayed with me over the years. If don't be scared of a challenge, you know, what, what's the worst that can happen? You make some mistakes. Well, but you learn from them, get on with it. And if I hadn't done that, I could, I had two options at that point, walk away because hang on a minute. I, I there's so many things I don't know how to do here. Um, or give it a go, give it your mm. best, figure out what goes and learn as you go and you'll get better at it or give up. And a lot of people unfortunately do give up when they enter sales because it seems hard and it's perhaps not what they expected. It's not as easy. It's not just money handed on a plate. But, you know, that's one of the, hopefully one of the things that's stayed with me over the years is, is hard work and tenacity and being open to learn things. And I'm still today have that attitude of learn every day, learn something new, no matter how small. Well, I, I definitely echo what you said. So I haven't worked in uh, recruitment myself. I know all too well how uh, difficult it is. Do you think back then that was kind of the norm that people were just, it was kind of sink or swim, here you go, go off and try and make your fortune? Or, or were there companies doing it better than that? I, I think it's still, I hear stories today where it can still be the norm. I think it was just the circumstance where I ended up, you know, one of those things. And, you know, some some people need the, the whole thing around them. Um, I, I guess I... What, what I had was confidence in, I know what I'm talking about with technology. Boy, do I know that stuff. That's what I trained to do. So surely that will make up for the stuff that I don't know. I can quickly learn the products and stuff. So when I'm talking to customers on the phone, whilst I might have gaps other way where I don't know what I'm, you know, I don't know the answer, mm. but I do know a load of stuff that I can help them with. So it's not like I'm, I'm coming into it cold. But I think that's an important thing is not to be scared of, of facing up something where you don't know. Even today, you know, I hold nice job titles, chief revenue officer, and I'll speak to a customer. And I've had several in the past couple of weeks where I've said, do you know what? I don't know the answer to that, but I'm, I'm, I'm definitely going to find out. And thank you for asking, because I'm going to learn something now that I didn't know. And I'll come back. And it's how you handle it. It's not the fact. No one knows everything. And it's better to be honest and transparent that you don't know. Or even if I'm not sure, I'll say, I think I'm pretty sure this is the answer. If you put a bet, I'd say, hi, 90, I'm pretty sure we can do this, but I'm going to come back and confirm it because I don't want to take the risk either way. And also it will confirm to me that my knowledge gets better. So thank you for asking that question. A lot of it is behavioral, how you deal with people, not the, not facts, not you don't have to be the cleverest in the room, but how did you deal with them? How did you handle a question? How did you handle helping them or supporting them people respect that i that's that's the experience i've learned over the years is it's mm. not about being the know-all it's not about just saying yes to everything it's about how you service that conversation in a mm. way that the recipient is happy with the outcome yeah and i suppose that um the fact that you came from that that technical background definitely probably gave you an edge over a lot of other people in, in those early days well, I think it, it does today. It means I can talk to people and understand. I understand a little bit more about what they're what they're talking about, and I can also engage with more technical people in a more robust manner. But but you know that's just because I accidentally went through that journey. Mm -hmm. And I always say to people, everyone has got different value to bring to a conversation because we've all been through a different journey. I've got young salespeople working for and with me at the moment that I'm coaching, and I've said to them, guys. Don't think I know all the answers to every approach. I've just done it a lot more because I've been through more journeys. But if you think whether well, there's a scenario, I'll often ask them, I'll say, what, what should I do here? I'll say, well, what do you think you should do? Give me, <laughs> give me your thoughts first. Well, let me give you the answer. And often they'll come up with something. And I've said to them, sometimes, guys, you'll come up with something that I may not have thought of because I'm blinkered by the journey and experience I've had. So mm -hmm. I may immediately say the answer is ABC. You may say ST, you know, RST or whatever, um, a different approach. And I might go, I never thought of that. I like that better than what I would have come up with. Everyone's got a, an opinion and a voice, right? Experience mm. gives you something to draw upon, but it doesn't always mean that you therefore have the best answer. 
Indeed, I agree with that. Um, when I when I was on your LinkedIn profile earlier, Ian, I don't think I've ever clicked show more experience, show more experience uh, as many <laughs> times as I have on your profile, or on any profile, indeed. You've had so many different roles. How, because obviously you've been kind of in the industry since the days of, the very early days of um, kind of computing. How have you seen the industry change and how have companies kind of evolved as, as you know, technology um, has got to kind of where it is today. What, what, what's been your experiences of, of the changes? Sure, and, and, and thanks for making it sound like I'm a job hopper, which I'm not, right? You're uh, definitely not, no. It, it, it was, it was a very of, insightful work. Yeah, it's a couple yeah. of things, because I put a lot more detail than people put on there, I think, and mm. also non-exec roles and other things. But, um, yeah, so it, it's changed. I, I mean, I came into computing when it was sort of its midway, I guess. It, it was... You know, we, we just at the time we were starting to see not quite the, the small laptops, but certainly desktops and PCs and, and that type of the arena. And we were starting to see networks and not just mainframes. But now we take technology for granted, right? There, I, I, you know, there was a time when Bill Gates very early on and, and, and Apple were talking about a, desk, a, a PC on every desktop that would work. Well, we've gone beyond that. I would argue everyone's probably got, how many people haven't got one at home in some way, whether it be a tablet, you know, you can argue that's a PC in itself. It's just a different delivery mechanism. All you need today is a browser. Your smartphone is a computer, whether you like it or not. It's, it just isn't labeled such, but it has a browser. You can go on it. You can do word processing. You can do whatever you, and the screens are getting bigger. So computing has become increasingly day by day, more consumable, more accessible to more people and, and delivers more power for less cost. That's the incredible thing. You know, we now have in our hands, in a phone, more power than would have been in a mainframe, which would have filled a building only a few decades ago. Um, and more well, it's power... crazy when you say it like that. Ian. Yeah, it's, well, it's, it's more unbelievable. Power... <laughs> the one quote I saw is, is you have more power, and it is it's way factual, you have ex- exponentially more power in your smartphone, in your hand, than NASA had to land people on the moon. <laughs> if, if you believe they did it, of course, which is a whole other debate. But... But that's, that's where we're at. It's more affordable now, and it's continuing to become more affordable. Every year we're seeing iterations um, of more power for less cost. And the great thing about that is the innovation it's driving, as I described a, a few moments ago. Because of that incredible compute power and it being cheaper, people can innovate. Individuals, products and ideas and technologies that before would have been cost preventative you know for you to if, if, if you've got a few college friends and you've got an idea it would have been how are we going to get money to even get the computer the, the kit we need to be able to try and build this mm. now now you can just go on the internet in the cloud power up some stuff use it pay pay by the second to amazon and develop things and create things and we've seen uber we've seen um you know just eat all these all these food and delivery mechanisms we've seen amazon mm. we've seen you think of the amount of companies that have innovated and changed the way we interact and live on a daily basis. What would we have done without Amazon during COVID? Let just debate mm. that one. Think about that. Is how many people like me and I've many conversations. I'm sure everyone who listens to this will be, oh yeah, I did that. Where there was something, whatever it be, and you just went, oh, I'll get it on Amazon. Not because you 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 would maybe you wouldn't have bought it there before. You know what whatever it was, toothpaste and whatever, whatever it was, you you couldn't go out, you didn't want to go out or didn't feel comfortable or couldn't get it, you went online. How many people signed up to Zoom and Teams and started doing video with family and friends, which they never used before because there was no need for it. Millions and millions of people have used new technologies and found new ways of doing things to you know sustain themselves during COVID. Mm. I, I kind of think to myself though what could possibly be next what is you know i know technology is constantly evolving but you know is there anything that you know is still to be designed that we do actually need you know I, and i think to myself where is the future well funny enough I, i'm a school speaker and I, when i've spoken to mm. schools i've used exactly that i've said look and i show some of the old technology bits and bobs that i've still got go look guys what i always show is the old usb stick and, and the old floppy disk and whatever go how much data you had on there? Well, yeah, I show a floppy <laughs> That's disk. a blast from the past. Well, kids look at it and they go, "What is it?" And they don't even know what it is, let alone. And I, say, and I tell them <laughs> how much you could get on that disk, right? And and now you won't even do it. You'll put it in the cloud. It's infinite. 
but you'd have needed for a piece of software. There were times when you needed 128 of these disks to install one piece of software. And you sit there, wait for the first one for five minutes, change the disk. Change, and they're like, what? Well, that was only a couple of decades ago. Mm. Right. And what I say to them is we've now got Uber and all these things. Great. What's next? And there will be something today while we're on this call. And I'd say this every year. There'll be something that we haven't discovered on the Internet yet. It's out there or it's, it's a fledgling idea or someone's in a back office or in a bedroom today coding away something which is going to become the next um, big thing. It's going to be, you know, a, an Airbnb or, it, it, you know, how quickly some of these companies went from nothing to some of the biggest companies in the world in five, six, seven years. That is possible today if you've got the right idea that people will benefit from when they want. Right. Instagram was sold after, I think, very little limited time to Facebook for a huge amount of money. You know, and we've now got TikTok and all these other things that we didn't know we needed. And I, you could argue whether we need them now, actually. But there are so many things that are, are being innovated. There is someone today who's got a small company, maybe on the Internet, and none of us have come across it yet. But in three years time will be a household name. The opportunity is there. It's what's it going to be? And, and I think we're going to see continual innovation. It's going to be interesting over the next five or 10 years, what else appears. That, Do you think that... there's any negatives that have come from the continualization of um, the technology or do you think it's all positive? No, there are negatives. And I'll give you one that I talk about in, mm. in my everyday business life and particularly during COVID is the number of people, for example, that will do an email exchange and say they had a conversation with someone. They'll say, oh yeah, I chatted to them yesterday. And when you actually ask, is that, oh, well, no, what it was is like we emailed each other a couple of times. That's not chatted, right? Mm. That, that, that's a communication, communication and conversation. And I think during COVID, the video and the online conferencing and all this stuff enabled us to stay in touch with people who, who we wanted to. But there is a danger of technology. And we see it if you, if you observe kids today. I mean, our kids, we monitor they don't have phones and all this stuff and we and we you know i've got a, a seven-year-old and a ten-year-old and we're very careful about access we give them so it's so it's moderated mm. but how many are the easy answer is give them an ipad and let them play on that for, for all day because it keeps them quiet but they're not interacting they're not going out yeah. and playing with their friends in the football pitch and kicking a football or they're not, we all have to get comments, right? We'll go out and, and people will see our kids drawing pictures, you know, in the pub with drawing or we're playing Uno. And we'll get, we've had people comment, go, oh, it's so nice to see people doing this sort of stuff and not having just being on screens. It's too easy for millennials and Zeds and, and the new generation because they've been born into it. They've never known a time without that technology because all of these technologies, particularly smartphones, are designed to be addictive. They're, they're, they are compelling by design. There are documentaries on this, and that's yeah. the downside, I think. That's the downside, I think, where you'll end up with three kids meeting up, and then they're chatting to each other on the phone. You're in front of each other. Put your phone in your pocket. Yeah, you might want to check it to check if your mates are coming or whatever, but you watch them, and you see them together for two or three hours in the park, and for 90% of that, they're on their phones. Yeah, I, I, I agree with you, and I've seen the documentaries, and I also think the, these things are highly addictive. They, they play with the human psyche, don't they, to keep you on them. You only need to look at when you've got WhatsApp. What, what's the purpose of last seen and typing? It's, it's to keep you looking at the screen. Yeah. Um, and it's, it's, I, think, I think it sets a dangerous precedent when, you, um, when technology starts you know, appealing to human addictive tendencies. But I think that's a whole other conversation. Either. It is. So, so you, you've got to this position and you've sat on boards all over the place. Uh, what, what's you, been your kind of experience of being brought into these companies? Is there kind of typical things that you attend to brought in, that you're brought in even to deal with? Or is there things that you see that, you know, is, oh, I've seen this one a lot before. Or, yeah. you know, what's your kind of experience has been like? Yeah, I think there's a couple of things. I think one is... Um... And a number of simple phrases come to mind. Keep it simple. I think a lot of people overcomplicate things, for the, you know, unnecessarily. And the other one is people often a lot of a lot of things don't happen because people don't speak up. You know, and that's a cultural thing in an organisation. Is uh, and I already described. I encourage my team to speak up, guys. As long as you do it respect, to, you know, respectfully and politely. Mm. You know, don't come and charging in. We're going. We shouldn't be doing this. Uh, we can't do this, um, you know, be respectful of 
the individuals that you're dealing with, then sp but speak up because often you've got the best idea. And if you don't speak up, then nothing gets done. And I've seen this before where I, I, I've joined organizations and I've looked at something and thought, well, this doesn't make sense. So I've asked those individuals and forced the question at them. What, why, why are you doing this? And if I get the answer where, oh, we were told to, okay, but what do you think? And you see, mm -hmm. when no one's ever asked me what I think, I've been told this is the process by more experienced, more senior people. I said, well, what do you think? You're, you're doing it. Well, it doesn't, and you feel them, hes you feel their hesitancy, right? Of, yeah. Just say it, guys. Tell me how it is. I'm not going to shoot you down. I want to learn. Well, it doesn't make sense. It's ridiculous. Why? Because of A, B, C, and D, and it doesn't do this. What would you do? Well, I'd do this and this. And you can get insight from it. They know it, but they keep doing it because they know it's bad. They know it's not creating the output and the, and the success that's, you know, you want from whatever that process is. But they they don't feel comfortable to speak up and just say, guys, this is madness. There's a much better way of doing this. And they've got the solution often. I see you, that again and again. Do you find often that there's a, kind of a disconnect between the technical team and the sales team? Because that's a very different type of personality between both. Yeah, and, and, and often across other departments as well, Jason, marketing and sales, right? There's, there's always this talk about sales and marketing don't align. And again, it's not rocket science. It's you need to get in each other's pockets and understand where the other person's coming from. See what the world from their shoes. Now, with technical people, it's easy for me because I was one of them and, and I get where they're coming from and I bridge that gap well. But it, it's understanding what are their drivers? What goals have they been given? What are their KPIs? What are they trying to achieve? And often the same with technical people. If you look at sales, they don't understand because it's never been explained to them. Oh, sales, they keep promising. They, they, they want this or they want that. Whatever it is, there's this disdain often comes up or this, this disconnect between different departments of blame of, well, yeah, it's their fault that we have to and do this now and this sort of thing. But it's not difficult to sit down and, and it should come from leadership, right? It shouldn't be the individual's responsibility of, guys, we should help each team understand what the other's role is. Because if you sit in their shoes for a day, if you start to see what they do, you start to open the eyes and go, oh, crikey, I didn't realise you had to deal with that. Oh, I didn't mm. realise. I didn't realise when we talked to a customer and say, oh, yeah, it's easy to promise this. I didn't realise the impact on you guys that then you're then, you've, you've got this problem at the back end, you've got all this pressure to deliver something because we've promised something that too quick and too early that shouldn't be there. Every, you know, there's an impact across departments in a company, understanding what the cross impact is. People t tend not to, because they're in their silo. The salespeople know their mm -hmm. job. Programmers, well, aren't they, I, understand, I, don't, I don't understand why they, they can't code it quicker. What, what, what do you mean? They're, they're always late in, in delivering the new function. But you don't understand, you're saying that from an, a point of not understanding. Yeah. You need to, if, if you're willing to complain, you need to be willing to spend some time to understand and look at it from someone else's eyes. And I find the more you understand it, the, the better you do your own job and the better as an mm. organization, you support each other and you get more successful. And again, it's not rocket science, but you, but it is about taking action. And if you don't take the action, again, keep it simple. How difficult is it to do that and make sure people not, not can do their job, but at least appreciate what the other individual's job role, what, what their what their role is, what their pressures are, and what the impact you have on them is by your actions. I suppose a lot of that comes down to, you know, the management and the company to kind of educate people. And I guess there's been times when you've gone into um, companies and realised, hang on a minute, I can't fix this situation. There's a problem here with certain members of management and, you know, we're not going to be able to fix this without axing these people. Yeah, there's a particular example that I'll, I'll mention very briefly and very carefully to protect the innocent, where I was brought in to help them, as I've done with many organisations, drive revenue upwards because they, you know, often it's just people either can't see the wood for the trees because they're too close to it to things, or they need it. They need context of, of fresh eyes looking at it with different experience to say, well, I've done this before. Why haven't we tried this? And yeah, it was an organization where the founders were the owners. And if you want something to improve, one of the things you've got to accept is change. If every change that's proposed is no, 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 we've always done it that way. And that was so-and-so's decision. And we're not changing that because it, it might reflect badly, right? Because it, that says they did it wrong. And my view is, well, it didn't say you did it wrong. It, it may say you did it right, right decision at the right time, but we're now in a different time, but nothing could be changed. It was one of those, everything is a protected uh, piece. And if, well, if you can't let me change anything, 
I can't get you the results, the output that you want. You want changed results, but you don't want to change anything to create the results. Well, that's I'm. I like to think I, I know what I'm doing, but and I'm relatively clever, but I'm not that clever. So yeah, that one I had to walk away from, unfortunately. Um, I gave it nine months, and then I had to realise this this is just not fixable. Right. And I want to move on just um, to what advice would you give people that want to get into um, IT sales? And I think um, me and you can both appreciate what makes a great um, salesperson, Ian. But, you know, I I know all too often these days um, I see people with business development manager and I get flooded with emails, um, but I get little calls. I'm sure that's going to feature in part of your answer, but not to second guess you there. But what advice would you give to someone that is really ambitious that wants to get into the sales industry and perhaps sees the shiny cars that you saw and perhaps the more slicker, more modern mobile phones uh, on offer these days? Yeah, I, so there's a couple of things. One is sales is not easy, so don't don't perceive it's just the good side. You know, it, here's the thing that normally scuppers people who haven't thought about this before they try and get into sales is in, in a normal job, you typically get an annual review and it's private. So people might get a gist of you or you're doing a good job or not but it's pretty private. In sales, you are being reviewed publicly all the time because your numbers are up there, right? It's If you've had, a, whether, whether it's a weekly target or a month, typically it's monthly, but is everyone across the business can see, oh, well, how's sales doing and who's top dog and, and, and how the sales how the sales men and women doing? Um, and it's visible. That's, you know, yes, there's your behaviors and, and how polite you are and all the, all the other things, but the number one metric that's visible that you're judged by is visible across the business. So you're sort of being reviewed all the time publicly. And a lot of people don't like that. Once they get into it, they don't realize, they haven't thought that through at the beginning of how visible you are. And, and you've got to be able to take the good and the bad. You will get rejection. You will get, um, you will lose deals you thought you were going to win that you were counting on and you thought this is great and I've put all this effort into it and it looks like I'm going to win. And it may be through no fault of your own because the customer gets acquired or the prospective customer, the person leaves or some circumstance changes. How many deals were stopped because COVID, how many salespeople were about to close something and COVID hit mm-hmm. and they were closing something, a big deal in the travel industry and suddenly they weren't getting that business, right? So you've got to be resilient and, and tenacious in sales to live with that, that it isn't all roses, it isn't all the shiny stuff and you've got to work hard all, all that stuff. However, if you like dealing with people, it's a great place to be and you continually learn. You get you get to see often lots of different environments. I've been in to meet in military establishments. I've been into so many different businesses and different industries in their offices. Look at all the experiences I've had. Like, where, where would I have had the chance to go into a, a behind the scenes at the Natural History Museum for meetings and, and places you wouldn't see or, or police forces? And because you go in for meetings, right? And you, you, do. you get you get behind the, oh, this is, so you get a lot of variety, you often get travel. And so there's a lot of, you know, it, it, it's, it can be a really uh, exciting area if once you deem it's right for you. To get into it, one thing I would say is p- people often, oh, well, I, I, there's, there's so many salespeople around and, and they're probably way better than me. I have the pleasure, and you mentioned some of the awards, um, but I also have the pleasure of engaging through, I recruit people, of course. Um, so I get to meet a lot of salespeople and across different industries, and I see the good, the bad, and the ugly. And, and my opinion is most salespeople are relatively average and not as good as they could be. And part of that is because they've been doing it a while and think they know it all. I am still learning. I've been doing this 30 years or so, and I'm still learning how to be better at questioning. And people listening to this, if you listen to it and think that's a good thing, then you're on the right side. If you think, well, you must be bad then because I've got questioning. All pa- I bet you haven't. I- I've challenged so many salespeople who say they're really good at questioning and then in a few minutes conversation realize they're not that good at questioning. They thought they were, but no one's ever coached or trained them on anything different. So a lot of salespeople are average at the fundamentals of sale- selling. So if you come into it, if you do the right things, right behaviors, I've got, I've trained and coached a lot of young salespeople to be very successful because I've just made them realize, guys, you, you keep learning. Every customer interaction you have, you'll learn something different and you practice. Every single one is another practice for you of engagement, of questioning, of listening, of finding out as much as you can in a way that is better than any other salesperson they're engaging with. 
Ian, I, a lot of the points, actually pretty much all of the points you've said, I can totally relate to because I think I feel the same myself. Um, a decade in this and I don't feel that I stopped learning either. It's There's been so many pearls of wisdom that you've shared with us um, throughout this half an hour. And I'm really grateful. If people want to find out more about you or indeed uh, One Up Sales, where can they go to? Sure. Thank you for that opportunity, Jason. So oneupsales.co.uk and you'll find, find the business I work for. And me personally is an easy one. If you go to earmoist.co.uk, that will take you directly to my LinkedIn profile. M-O-Y-S-E. There we go. That is <laughs> Ian, it's been a delight. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you. That was Ian Moyes from Wokingham, Chief Revenue Officer at One Up Sales. I'm Jason Connolly. Thanks for listening to the Career Success Podcast. Until next time. Goodbye.